the search for extraterrestrial intelligence has gone on for decades now to no avail. And while it's true that the galaxy is enormous, and indeed we've barely looked, what is clear is that alien civilizations aren't very obvious. We do not see them every day, except perhaps one day over 40 years ago where we might have. On August 15, 1977 at Ohio State University's Big Ear Radio Telescope, a signal was detected very close to the 1420 MHz hydrogen line, the frequency in which neutral hydrogen emits radio in nature, and a marker for where to locate and send a signal if you wish to say hello to other civilizations practicing science in the galaxy. Alien scientists practicing radio astronomy too would know of the hydrogen line. The signal was also a very strong one, unusually so, and it was narrowband, leading my guest, who was analyzing the data several days later, to famously write the word WOW on the printout, and to this day, the WOW signal remains the best candidate for an alien signal received thus far, and bears all the expected hallmarks of one. In fact, it's such a strong candidate, it may well have been it. Welcome to Event Horizon, with John Michael Godier. In today's episode, John is joined by Dr. Jerry Eman. Dr. Eman is a retired radio astronomer from Ohio State University. He worked with the Big Ear Radio Observatory during its SETI survey program for over 30 years. On August 15, 1977, Dr. Eman detected the strong narrowband radio signal known as the WOW signal. Welcome everyone to Event Horizon with me, John Michael Godier. If you enjoy what you hear, fall into the event horizon, hit the like button, and become an active subscriber by ringing the bell. Dr. Jerry Eman, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. Now, Doctor, you are the person that famously wrote WOW right on the sheet of paper for the WOW signal of 1977. And this still to this day... 40 years later, this, this is still an unexplained signal that has no good natural explanation. Could it be said, could it be said that this is probably the closest we've come to something that might have been, might, and I stress that word, might, have been of alien origin? Uh, yes, I agree with that uh, description. The signal certainly has characteristics that suggest possible intelligence behind it, uh, but uh, of course we were not at the radio observatory being able to actually definitely prove that it comes from a signal from extraterrestrial civilization. On the other hand, no uh, scientist or engineer has been able to prove that it isn't from such a civilization. So we're left with an interesting possibility. So I'm thinking it, if this really were a, a true signal from an extraterrestrial civilization, it certainly would be the first one detected. But uh, being a scientist, I want proof. And in this case, proof is basically almost impossible to come by. And I'll, I'll tell you the reason why. Back in 1977, we were using technology of the time, or maybe of just a few years earlier. Now remember, this was uh, about five years before IBM came out with its personal computer, the PC. Uh, so we were using IBM machine called an 1130, which was a small end mainframe, but it didn't have much capability. 
as a matter of fact, it had the capability of an Apple II computer, <laughs> and the storage capability was only one megabyte, one million bytes, which was this amount that got put on a floppy disk back in those days. So not much storage was available for recording and saving the data. So what we had to do was make some compromises when we wrote the computer program to display the results on the printer. Now, the big year, which is the radio telescope you were using at Ohio State, the big year was originally designed and very successfully to do all sky surveys and create a radio map of the heavens, essentially. Tell us about that. What what initially did the, the Big Ear find? Well, the Big Ear, after its design, Dr. Krebs created three horns for three different frequency bands, one at 612 megahertz, one at 1415 megahertz, and another one at 2600 megahertz. The first and third of those were dispensed with in later years. So we stuck with the 1,415 megahertz. That is, we observed over an 8 megahertz bandwidth from 1,411 to 1,419 megahertz, which is just outside the region of neutral hydrogen because we weren't interested in in, uh, detecting neutral hydrogen specifically. That had been done earlier by other observatories. But we were interested in locating discrete sources and identifying the position, right ascension and declination, the two coordinates, and the signal strength, also called flux density. And uh, we uh, did that for a total of over 19,000 radio sources that we discovered, about half of which had never been detected before by any observatory. We published our results in the Astronomical Journal in about seven segments over the years and uh, recorded a table of the position and the signal strength. And then we had separate contour maps, very much like the topographic maps you see of, of the Earth's surface and that indicated also the strength of the source the stronger the source, the more contours that were shown. So that became a major program for us. And during the process of measuring these sources, we found using other data as well that some sources had an unusual spectrum. That is, the the strength as a function of frequency turned out to be kind of unusual or unexpected in several cases. So we as a group made trips down to National Radio Astronomy Observatory in Green Bank, West Virginia, and used their 300-foot dish and 140-foot dish. And we also made a couple trips up to Algonquin Park in Ontario using their 150-foot dish to gather more information of at different frequencies about some of these sources. So went beyond our own data and got data from other observatories. With this All Sky Survey, this this telescope, the Big Ear. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. This was this was designed by Dr. John Krauss, who was also essentially running the program there for the, the All Sky Survey. How did this telescope work? What what did it do that was different than a giant dish telescope like what you were talking about with Green Bank? Okay, I'm going to direct you to the uh, home page of the uh, Big Ear website. There's a section with a green background called Big Ear Structures, comments about the above aerial photograph of the Big Ear Radio Telescope. And the link, the link for everybody listening, the link will be in the description below. Right. So the, the link takes us to a page that shows uh, the aerial photograph of the big ear. And I uh, programmed in seven hot spots where if you put a 
cursor of your computer on, say, the ground plane, the flat section between the, the two reflectors, a screen comes up and gives a description of the ground plane and, and some photographs. And that can be done for a total of seven spots, one for the flat reflector, one for the parabolic or paraboloidal reflector at the south end, uh, the ground plane, the horns that collect the energy that are reflected off the telescope, and the, the building that was our main center for conducting meetings, and another, well, another one that uh, a little building that has a theodolite like instrument that is used to set the declination of the flat reflector or, or the telescope as a whole, plus a, a turntable that was used for antenna testing. So all of these seven spots, you can see photographs and read a description of what's happening. So the basic design involved a flat reflector that was tiltable. Originally, it was 260 feet wide, later expanded to 340 feet wide with two extra sections at each end. The slant height was 100 feet. Then this was tiltable one bay at a time, that is one section at a time, but they were linked together so one could only make small movements of one section before you had to move the next section over. So originally there were seven sections or seven bays, and later on two more were added, so that made nine. The a signal from the north-south line called the meridian would come in and the signal would be reflected off the flat reflector, which was actually a mirror to radio waves, go across the ground plane and be reflected off the curved paraboloidal mirror, and then that focused the signal into uh, two horns that were side by side, so we actually got two signals about a minute and a half apart as the Earth rotation carried the radio telescope beam across the sky. And uh, then the, the, the radio signal would be converted to a small electrical current or voltage fed down into a receiver that amplified many millions of times. And then a computer... Well, the, the signal would be analyzed, actually uh, digitized, and then the computer would pick up that digital signal and record it on uh, computer printouts. Or on a, back in the early days, a strip chart recorder to get the total signal strength over the band of frequencies and we were observing, for the most part, between 1,411 and 1,419 megahertz, an 8 megahertz bandwidth. The larger the bandwidth, the, the greater the sensitivity. I see. Now, you mentioned that you weren't what, what they initially, with the, with the sky survey part of this, they weren't interested in neutral hydrogen. Now, neutral hydrogen is, correct me again if I'm wrong, that is the 1420 megahertz frequency that the WOW signal was picked up on. So this original all-sky survey probably wouldn't have seen the WOW signal, right? That's right. Now, what changed when when you guys started, uh, you decided, okay, we have the, the Ohio survey done, you know, sky survey is done. We're going to start looking at the hydrogen. Well, yeah, there was, there was, a, there was a development before, just before the seventh survey was out. John Krauss was unable to obtain funding to continue the process. We had, he had gotten funding from the National Science Foundation, and suddenly, I believe due to, I don't know if well, it's a law or a decision by the National Science Foundation, probably with the help of U.S. Congress, uh, to uh, stop 
or reduce the amount of money being sent to universities and in favor of sending the money to national facilities like the National Radio Astronomy Observatory in Green Bank, West Virginia, Kitt Peak, and other, and uh, the uh, Arecibo dish in Puerto Rico, to fund those more heavily uh, at the expense of universities like Ohio State. I believe Berkeley got caught in this same process, and I think the University of Illinois was another one. So uh, some several universities got caught, and in our case, John Krause was unable to get sufficient funding. So Bob Dixon, who was who had become the assistant director of the Radio Observatory, made a suggestion to John Krause that we move away from the Ohio Sky Survey, which uh, required several people being paid to do the analysis of the data, get away from that process and have another observing program observing narrowband signals that could be handled by the computer that didn't require much uh, human analysis. Actually, the only human we had involved for the most part was a mechanical technician who was on site to keep uh, mechanical things going, and we trained him to stop the computer, tear off the computer printout, and then restart the computer and we could go for three to four days of observing before the computer ran out of space or before we wanted to change the position of the flat reflector to observe another uh, section of the sky. So essentially the, the, the telescope ran itself and the technician would check on it every three or four days and restart everything and then drop off the data printouts to you, right? Yes, he, he took the... Uh, the printout. At that time, I had volunteered to look at the computer printout with the condition that they be delivered to my home. This mechanical technician, Mike, what's his name, was, uh, that's his nickname, actually. His last name was Mike Soul. Mike would bring me the printout. Uh, he actually built a little box and painted it white <laughs> and put the paper inside, the computer printout inside, so it was a protective from the rain. And then when I would get home from, from uh, teaching, I would get out the computer printout and look at it, and with my red pen, circle interesting numbers, strong, uh, rec- strong outputs on the printout, and... Uh, and the wow signal was by far the strongest, which is why the word wow, which is why I wrote it, because it was clearly, at that time, it was the strongest that I had seen, and it turned out that it was, in fact, the strongest that he ever saw on the computer printout. So I, uh, I, I noticed, I knew right away we had uh, something very interesting. Now, we'll get directly into the wow signal and why it was so interesting, but we'll need to take a break in the meantime. But I want to ask you one other question. One thing that that struck me um, was how inexpensive the big year was to build. I think I read $250,000 initially, which would have been in the 1960s, so adjusting for inflation is quite a bit more now. But... Why have why don't we have this capability anymore? I know that the original big year was the the land was sold and it was uh, demolished, but why why do we not have a successor to this telescope? Yes, John Krauss uh, certainly commented that uh, it was a design that was very relatively inexpensive, biggest uh, collecting area for the bucks. And it served a useful purpose. Unfortunately, there was a major disadvantage of this design. In order to move to a, you had to depend on the Earth's rotation. That's no big deal. Uh, and you had to set the 
flat reflector to a certain angle and let three or four days go by to get duplicate or triplicate or quadruple signals from the same portion of the sky in that declination band and then move it, move the flat reflector a sixth of a degree, which actually moves the beam a third of a degree in the sky. So it, it took years, actually, to observe the entire sky that was visible, about 100 degrees in declination. And so it was a slow process. And then also uh, for the sky survey, it required a, a group of folks to do a lot of analysis. This was early on, and, and computers weren't as uh, advanced as they are these days. So it took a lot of effort of uh, individuals to, to get the data analyzed properly. So over time, other telescopes simply had more capability. Those countries or universities that had, were able to get more money and more money did come in to, to astronomy uh, in later years. The other designs were just uh, more capable, more flexible. You could observe, you could scan across a source and get the information about one source in just a few minutes. And in contrast to trying to scan the whole sky or, or much of the sky to locate the sources. So the newer radio telescopes were tending to uh, study an individual source or an individual small region of the sky rather than what we were doing was to scan the whole sky visible and see what was there. So different, different approaches different approaches. Now, one thing with the sky survey was that they looked at the Andromeda galaxy and noticed that there were roughly at certain positions, there was a kind of radio halo uh -huh. around the galaxy in a certain way. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I was involved in that. That happened uh, before I joined the group, but that was actually done by, uh, I believe it was done by the previous radio telescope called the 96 Helix Antenna at 250 megahertz. But anyway, the uh, it, Andromeda was galaxy, M31, was studied and mapped. So I'm trying to think, yeah, actually it actually was done before with the previous telescope, and then our big year did it as well as one of the first uh, projects. It's possible that we are seeing ordinary dust and gas clouds that eventually would collapse to form stars, in other words, nebulae, but uh, un unless we are actually seeing neutral hydrogen, and I don't, and we were, should not have been seeing that if we were observing it 1,415 megahertz uh, as we were doing normally with the big year later on. And we have to take a break. I'm joined today by Dr. Jerry Eman. When we get back, we will talk much more in depth about the WOW signal. Be sure to like, subscribe, and share the video. And now, back to John. And we're back with Dr. Jerry Eman. Now, Dr., the, the WOW signal, when it was picked up by, you know, automatically as we were talking about the radio telescope. And I assume you got it several days later and, and you, you were looking through the data. What was your reaction when you saw that? I mean, you wrote, wow, but what, what did you think when you, when you actually were writing those words? Well, I, I knew we had something special. Actually, of course, the word wow is, is almost self-explanatory something represents something unusual and this was certainly unusual the uh, I, I looked at the set of characters 62 uj5 and saw that the signal was increasing in strength and then decreasing 
just like we would expect for a strong source that's being transiting our beam, starting out low in strength and then high as it gets centered on the beam and then drops off again. So I, I knew within a few seconds that that uh, this was a, a very strong signal. I also knew it was the strongest I had ever seen. And I noticed, of course, it appeared in just one channel, channel two, uh, which made it a narrow band signal. And so it, it fit the concept of a narrow band signal that might be one from an extraterrestrial civilization. Couldn't prove it, of course, and still can't prove it, but that's what I was thinking. And that was one of the purposes of going to the narrow band survey because we were hoping to to catch a signal from an extraterrestrial civilization. The search for extraterrestrial intelligence, SETI, was one of the goals of going to our narrowband detection survey. Now, the signal being narrowband, to start this off, the, nature does not like to produce narrowband signals. It can, but it doesn't like to. You usually don't see them. You see these broadband signals from stars and things like that. So when you look for a narrowband signal, you're, you're looking for technology, essentially. So could anything in the universe that we know about, natural, produce a narrowband signal at 1420 megahertz? At 1420 megahertz, there was an agreement that there would be no transmissions in, in that frequency band by any country, actually, to allow it to be used for receiving only by radio telescopes. And so when we saw the signal, and I told John Krauss and Bob Dixon about it, and we had a meeting over it, John started to look at possible sources that could generate such a signal. He looked through satellites and, and many uh, other things, and uh, planets and so forth couldn't find anything that would account for this signal, so it had to be left as an unknown source. And of course, we don't know the distance either. That's the difficulty in radio astronomy is many times you only know the right ascension and declination, that is the two angular coordinates in the sky, the signal strength, but there's normally no way to know the distance. Now, there are exceptions. If you know you're looking at a black hole at the center of our galaxy, we know the distance to the center of our galaxy and so forth, although black hole would not be generating narrowband signals anyway. So, you know, we, we just couldn't pinpoint what source, what optical source we might be dealing with. And the other downside was we had dual beam reception. That is, we had two horns side by side, and the radio source, as the Earth's rotation carried the beam across the sky, the Earth the uh, appears that the sources were moving into one horn and then out of that horn, and then into the other horn, and then out of that horn. And unfortunately, the dual horn system was set up in such a way that one horn was considered to be positive and the other was considered to be negative. That is, the signals from the positive horn were kept positive. The signals from the other horn, called the negative horn, were actually subtracted from from the background. Uh, so we we should have seen two signals. Now... Unfortunately, when we wrote the computer program, we were trying to get all 50 channel signals being displayed, so we had only one print position for each channel. So we made the decision, actually, I did, I did the writing of the program, as the app part of the program, and I said, okay, well, we'll just take the absolute value of the signal level and that will allow us to 
capture the signal strength with the coding that I've described in the website in just one position. Well, after the wow signal came through and we couldn't tell which horn the signal came through, it came through only one horn, and we don't know which horn, that was a little bit frustrating. And fortunately, Bob Dixon happened to discover or remember, I'm not sure which, that Fortran, the computer programming that much of our uh, observing program was written in, had the capability of, instead of moving the, the printer to the next line, it could stay in position, move the carriage to the left edge of the paper, and then you could send another set of codes for the 50 channels. And so we decided that we could place a minus sign if the signal was below zero, that is from the negative horn, and that way a negative signal would appear on the computer printout. But we didn't have that at the time the wow signal came through. So that, that happened a few months later, I think it was. One thing about this signal was that when you guys were setting up your study experiment, you thought, well, things move around the galaxy. You know, things move and Doppler shifts happen and you, you get all of this sort of um, changes to, the, to the, what you receive. Now, you decided to correct for this, um, the local standard of arrest. And the wow signal seemed to be corrected for that so that assuming that an alien civilization would correct their signal, right. the signal appeared to be corrected, right? Yeah, we, uh, yeah, Bob Dixon had the idea that we should do that. So he put in the code into the program that would account for the various motions the rotation of the Earth, the revolution of the Earth about the Sun, the motion of the solar system about the center of the galaxy, so that accounting for the Doppler effect for each of those motions, we get the signal receiver frequency that we should be looking at for each filter, each of the 50 filters, to be adjusted for that. And so the computer printout had one number that accounted for the frequency of one of the components in the uh, receiving leg so that we know we knew what frequency we were observing at. So the signal, that, that means that the signal was accounting for the galactic standard of rest and the Doppler effect. So whoever or whatever the origin of this was, was correcting for the motions of the uh, galaxy, right? Well, we don't know that. I mean, the idea was that if a, an intelligent civilization were to correct for their Doppler motions, and the assumption is that they were a civilization within our own galaxy, another solar system, they would correct to the center of our galaxy as well as their own planetal rotation and revolution about their star and the motion of this their solar system about the, the center of our galaxy, that if they did that, we should probably be detecting a signal if they were observing, if they were sending it in the middle of the, of the band that we had, we would observe it in the middle. Well, channel two is at the left edge, so that uh, was, we still saw it, but uh, it was very close to not being seen at all. The, the distance question. Now, as you say, you don't, we don't really know how distant the wow signal was, but there is one factor here. It had to be at least past the distance of the moon, right? Yeah, or even maybe a little bit beyond. Yeah, John Krause uh, looked for uh, anything, you know, satellites or whatever, you know, in our system in our Earth system, and didn't see any. But just noticing the shape of the response, it appears that uh, it's not widened. Whatever the signal was would, would be of, of small angular size, 
and would reflect our antenna pattern virtually perfectly. That could only occur if the distance to the source were, you know, thousands of miles away. And I think at one time he also said it was at least half the distance to the moon or maybe even beyond the moon. But anyway, at quite some distance, which makes it... uh, but still, there's a lot beyond the distance of the moon in our galaxy, so we just have no idea what the distance would be, and just simply no way to determine it. If it if it had been very close, like if it had been a satellite, we would have seen the motion of the satellite, or if it had been an airplane, we would have seen the extreme motion of the and distortion of the beam shape that uh, resulted, and we would have known that it was uh, uh, in the Earth's atmosphere or ionosphere or reasonably close by. Of course, we didn't see that, so we have to conclude that it was out at some distance. And, yeah, the the moon comes into play here. It's got to be a good fraction of the distance to the moon or beyond the moon. We can't distinguish between those two possibilities. Now, as you mentioned, wow was a really strong signal for what you were looking for. And that stands out. As a matter of fact, the the infamous letters and numbers show specifically the signal strength. Now, could that suggest that it was close? Uh, Not quite, you know, say, let's just say somewhere out in the solar system. Could the wow signal have originated from within our local area out past the moon. Well, again, we can't tell what the signal strength was at the at the source. I mean, remember, we on Earth are putting out millions of watts in radars, and yet we're detecting millions of millions of millions of watts. You know, uh, the one thing that was determining of the when back with the Ohio Sky Survey is we were detecting radio sources with flux densities of two-tenths of a Jansky, and a Jansky is 10 to the minus 26 watts per square meter per, per hertz, and 10 to the minus 26 is a hundredth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a watt. <laughs> so extremely weak, and yet if you were to actually happened to visit these sources, you know, some tens of thousands of light years away, uh, you would be fried immediately (laughs) when you got too close. So, in other words, uh, a strong signal at the source does become a very weak signal when you're, say, 10,000 light years away. Now, the WOW signal was, there's always been this thing with SETI. The, the 1420 megahertz hydrogen line. And this is the frequency at which neutral hydrogen, as we've been talking, emits radio. Now, how close was the wow signal to 1420 and the actual center of the hydrogen line? How close are we? I mean, was it exactly dead on or was it somewhere close by? Where was it? Uh, the concept that we were thinking of is that if a intelligent civilization were to transmit the the neutral hydrogen uh, frequencies or in the band of the neutral hydrogen would be a great place to put in a narrow band signal because it would be easily spotted. And so that was actually the, the receiver was designed to observe in and around the 1420.4065, which is a neutral hydrogen frequency. Now, the signal was, as I recall, very tight. It was a very narrow band signal. 10 kilohertz it, it seems to stick in my mind. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, that was that was a filter size, filter bank. We had a filter bank of 50 channels, each 10 uh, kilohertz wide. 10 kilohertz, remember, is the uh, right around the size of an AM radio station, uh, which is typically uh, about the same size. So it's uh, 
Now, nowadays, most observatories are, are measuring down to one hertz wide or even a tenth of a hertz wide, and they're, they're using a different approach for the filter bank. But uh, back then, we were able to get from the National Radio Astronomy Observatory Green Bank uh, a filter bank, actually two filter banks, that they were not using. One had 10 kilohertz channels, and that's what we decided to use. There was another one that was wider by a factor of 10, and we decided not to use that filter bank. So anyway, the filter bank was a limitation on the width of the signal that we could detect. So the the narrow band signal might have been much narrower than 10 uh, kilohertz. Could it have been wider, but... It could not have been wider, could have been narrower. I see. Because if, if, the single, if the signal were, say, a thousand hertz wide, that is one-tenth of the width, we would receive one-tenth of what it was if it were 10 kilohertz wide. And, of course, we don't know the actual width of the signal other than it's, it's uh, 10 kilohertz or less. So we don't know how much but so if you were if you were a transmitting civilization you would want as narrow of a signal as you can get close to the hydrogen line you, just to save energy you right? bet yeah so this yes yeah. this, this is an efficient signal essentially right and we have to take a break i will be back in a minute with dr jerry eman discoverer of the wow signal and we're back with dr jerry eman now jerry the big year didn't just pick up the wow signal i mean it picked up other signals things that go bump in the night what were those and has any follow-up work been done to figure out what those other signals were well i'm not sure i understand what other signals of course anytime you know for the narrow band survey occasionally we would get uh, a signal that registered as a two or three or four once in a while, a six or seven, but they were they they lacked the ability to cover several segments of time. That is, you, the, you notice the wow signal covered seventy two seconds, six periods of twelve seconds each. Actually, the sampling was done every second for ten seconds. Then the computer needed two seconds to do its computing before starting another sampling. So the, the wow signal occupied six time frames of about 12 seconds each. These other signals that we might receive, you know, a one blip of a six or seven or a three or four, only lasted one time frame, occurred in one signal. And that's, that, you know, you can't do much analysis on, on those because it could have been something about the, the just the extreme bump of noise occurring or something else, and who knows what it could be. There's just there's just no way to analyze it. So not just no, not enough data to know what exactly any of those were. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And with Wow, we don't have a lot of data at all, as you note in your paper, half vast data. So we're we're looking at so there, there's not much there, but there's enough to say, hmm, we should look for more uh-huh. of these. So it, deep down, do you what is your what is your personal sense? Do you think that this was it, or do you think that this was oh maybe, but probably not likely? What do you what where are you? Or is your personal feeling looking at the data and being directly involved with the Big Ear Telescope? given the behavior of what you guys would see with the big ear, does this seem like it was it? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm convinced that the well signal certainly has the potential of being the first signal from an extraterrestrial intelligence, but I can't prove it. And on the other hand, no one has been able to disprove it. Now, there was a, uh, there was an article by an astronomer who uh, 
claimed that the wow signal was caused by comet, a comet. Well, I looked at his paper and concluded that uh, he didn't have things right there. There's, there was a, my major conclusion is the behavior of a comet does not match the behavior of the wow signal. That's the simple phrase I use. On top of that, though, if comets emitted a 1420 megahertz signal, radio astronomers would have seen that by now. Yes, and it, it could have been much wider than, than the 10 kilohertz, too. Absolutely. With, with various Doppler shifts and so forth. And then, unfortunately, this, this author, whom I'm not naming, but his name is out in the, in the public, uh, can be looked up, wrote a second paper still holding to the same idea, but fortunately other astronomers, many other astronomers, have agreed with my conclusion that the uh, behavior of the co of a comet does not match the behavior of a wow signal. That, the wow, that uh, a comet simply is, uh, couldn't have produced this narrowband signal that we observed. So uh, I, was, I was grateful to hear and read that from other astronomers. And uh, we also have in our websites here a note written by Bob Dixon. I had communicated to the Big Ear Radio Group my conclusions of, that, about this comet hypothesis and said I didn't agree with it, and others uh, in our group looked at it and did a little bit additional analysis and discovered, you know, they agreed with it. And so Bob wrote up this, this article. And that's, that's on our website here. The wow signal seems to be you're walking along the beach and you see a plastic bottle, a Pepsi bottle. And you look at it and you say, that's not natural, that's a Pepsi bottle. So it almost seems like the galactic equivalent to that, that it just looked so strange that there's just not a lot of other explanations for it. But could it have been a glitch in the equipment? Have you been able to eliminate that something in the equipment somewhere had not created the signal? Yeah, I, I, I certainly thought of that. However, the receiver and computer system was working before the signal came in and was working after the signal came in. So wouldn't it be interesting or unusual if suddenly the receiver uh, and computer, let's say the receiver, stopped working properly right at the moment that we got this signal? Uh-uh, I'm not buying that. And you never saw anything, any, any, anything from the equipment over the entire run lifetime of the telescope that would create a false signal that's right like this that's right that's correct. so chances are the equipment was was functioning quite well right and and the fact that we looked you know something like a hundred times over a year or two well we stayed at 30 days on that same declination to see if we saw the signal again and we didn't and then Months and years later, we went back to the same declination to reobserve and uh, didn't see anything. And then uh, a colleague, Bob Gray, went down to Tasmania and used radio telescopes there to try to, to locate a signal and didn't find anything. And I think went to Green Bank, uh, West Virginia and uh, used telescopes there and couldn't find anything. So this was this was a one-time thing, and that's perhaps not out of line if there's an intelligent civilization that's maybe sending a signal in one direction at one time and another direction at another time and is moving their telescope or device, whatever, uh, around and sending a signal and maybe does not sending many signals at all. Well, I mean, we've, we've sent signals, you know, from Arecibo, 1,000-foot dish, and so forth, but this was not done very often. And so if someone 
on another solar in another solar system a few thousand years light years away you know could have picked up our signal but wouldn't have found it again so it would have been their wow signal <laughs> That's right. We would uh, the Arecibo, the infamous Arecibo signal, or, or uh, transmission, is if anybody catches it, it's their wow signal because we didn't repeat it. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah, and and again, as you note too, maybe the transmitter pointed in a different direction. Maybe it's still transmitting. Maybe we will catch the wow signal again sometime. Is anyone looking? Oh yes. Oh yeah. Full time. Well, in that area. I mean, there, there's, uh, well, the Alma Array in Chile, 66 dishes, and the uh, there's a facility up in California, and I'm sure there are probably others that are uh, doing the search, you know, but they, they've got modern equipment, computers, so they can they've got a much greater chance of seeing something than than we did because it had to be a signal at the at the declination we were observing if we were observing at a different declination we wouldn't have seen it and that's that's true in general dr kraus did a calculation i found on the website under the seti primer that by conservative numbers, you plugging in conservative numbers to the Drake equation, he still concluded that there could be as many as forty civilizations in the galaxy if you if you look at the equation, which would mean that would it be that surprising if you've got that many civilizations at any given time in a galaxy? Would it be that surprising that you would uh, get a signal? <laughs> are, are you referring to John Krauss using uh, Frank Drake? Yes famous equation Mm -hmm. yes and from yeah well frank drake remember came up with (laughs) 10,000 10,000 by his calculation 10,000 uh civilizations at any given time so is yeah not over the court the whole lifetime within our within our galaxy within our galaxy 10,000 civilizations so you know the of course frank drake's equation is is very interesting but uh, you have to guess a lot at some of the factors and you can be guessing quite incorrectly perhaps you know so so if one person gets 40 and another gets 10,000 <laughs> you know there's clearly some uh, let's just say there's there's a concern about uh, have I got the right set of numbers but the fact that there's more than one right from my point of view there's more than one we are an intelligent civilization although looking at the at the politicians I'm not so sure about that <laughs> That's so I won't name names now so, doctor I have one he, I have one last question for you I got one last question for you I want to dispel something that's been floating around on the internet for some time about the WAV signal. People seem to think there was content, and there wasn't, of course. Talk you about... You mean a, that the 62UJ5 is a code for... Yes, signal strength. Code. Yes. Uh-huh. Okay. But, but the, you know, some people have said, well, there's a message there or something like that. Was there any modulation of the signal or anything that would lead you to believe that there was any information being conveyed? Okay. Here's the problem. The method of, of, uh, getting the data was to take a short sample, probably on the order of a millisecond or so, uh, of each of the 50 channels. And then, in the next second, repeat that process and then do that for 10 seconds running and then uh, add together for a given uh, filter, given channel, those 10 numbers and uh, divide by 10 or you just keep the the total. doesn't matter which way you do it. Uh, And uh, then convert... Well, 
subtract the background level from that, which is a com separate computation, and get the signal level above the background, or in the case of the negative form, below the background, and uh, also compute the, the uh, level of the noise, the randomness, and then divide the signal level by the noise level, and, and you then convert if, the, um, if it turns out to be anything from 6.0 to 6.9999, uh, get right down the, the number 6 on the computer printout. And do that, uh, and of course, when you get above 9, you start using the letters of the alphabet. And so forth. So we we got six E Q U J five, and uh, U is the equivalent of thirty, thirty times the noise for the peak. Now, uh, you can't tell too much from that. You can't tell anything about modulation because uh, we've had each. Each number is a, like a one millisecond sample, ten of them. And there's no way you can detect modulation with ten isolated one millisecond samples. I'm just using one millisecond as a, uh, you know, it could have been ten milliseconds. It couldn't have been much longer than ten milliseconds. But you can't, you can't. Uh, break out any modulation with such discrete data. So, in other words, in other words, with the system we had, yeah, you just you, the, even if there was something there, you just w w there was no way to detect it. So, all you really can t yeah. can say is there is a signal there. <laughs> you can't really yeah. say that. Now, remember, if you're talking to radio amateurs. Uh, if they're using the old AM, amplitude modulation, you can detect that uh, continuous signal running and, and pull out any modulation. Uh, same with FM, frequency modulation. Uh, if you convert to a digital form, like, uh, like many folks are now using, well, you have to sample frequently enough, many, many times a second, thousands of times a second, tens of thousands of times a second, to be able to, to extract the modulation. So the bottom line is, there was no way for us to detect the modulation, and we had no equipment that was designed to record the uh, continuous signal that we were receiving and uh, record it using Audacity or something like that, you know, uh, not convert it to, to the filters that we used. So that's the downside of, of our observing program. And uh, that's unfortunate. Now, now what about... Nowadays, nowadays, I was just going to say, nowadays, with current technology, uh, you know, getting the modulation is uh, much easier and, and quite possible. I see. Now, what about interstellar scintillation and its relation to the wow signal? It appeared to be a point source, right? Right. So you, there was no... You, if If... If you saw a signal that was very close through the Earth's atmosphere, you would see the same sort of effect that you see with the solar system versus the stars. You see scintillation with the stars, but not with non-point source um, things like planets. So you actually saw right. that effect with the, the WOW signal? Uh, no, I don't think you could claim that. Really? Uh I mean, we had only six data points, so uh, so there was no way to to detect 
scintillation. In this case, scintillation is, in a sense, similar to modulation, a variation of, a, of the amplitude or frequency, if it's FM, uh, and uh, all that we got was these six major data points, 60 QUJ5. Uh, so so there was no way determine. to detect. I see. I'm so, the, so or say again. So the interstellar medium, you were unable to determine if there was any kind of scintillation in the interstellar medium. That's correct. I see. Now that would have been, that's another, would have been really nice to have with the signal. Mm hmm. I agree. <laughs> Te technology uh, back in the good old days was not as technical or complete as it is these days. And, but we had to, we lived with what we had. Still, it, it yielded. To this day, the most interesting signal study it has ever uh, detected. Mm-hmm. And the narrow band survey certainly de did detect a signal that I could claim was wow. Wow. And, uh, yeah. And and the interesting thing was Krauss caught on to the word wow and declared it to be the wow signal. Uh, that was not my doing. That was John Krauss's doing. And uh, so he he uh, always in t in writing up an article uh, always talked about the wow signal. By the way, are you familiar with his uh, book Big Ear Two? Yes, I know. Yes. Um... Yeah, he had an original. The first version was Big Ear. That that was written before the wow signal came. Big Year 2, TWO, uh, now included uh, all about the wow signal. And uh, so that's, that's good reading. All right, Doctor. Um, it was a pleasure talking to you today. And uh, I, hope, I hope that the radio astronomers will keep looking for what the next wow signal. And then we can compare it to what you found. I hope so as well. So what do you think? Did the Big Ear Radio Telescope pick up an alien signal? In this case, it seems convincing that they might have, but we may never know for sure since the signal has never repeated. Imagine if one day it does. Thanks for watching Event Horizon. If you're new to our show, hit the subscribe button so you never miss an episode.